we've got quite a lot of stuff that we want to show today and, and want to listen to today. Um, so the first thing I think we're going to show, and I have to apologise as well because we're going to have to show um, kind of pasters. So it is going to be like that very annoying thing with Desert Island Discs where you're just getting into the song and it gets cut off. Um, and I'd like to say with the caveat and something that we can come back to that um, while we're going to show them some so quite short clips, of course, this is, this is almost the tip of the iceberg. Um, and the, the work that's gone into these has been kind of an incredible amount of what we might call slow methodology, slow method, um, sort of to try and map onto that kind of slow violence that um, and that, that kind of erasure of that. Erasure of that. So um, we're going to start with um, a trailer, a short trailer for one of your films, The Moment of Disappearance. And um, before we show that, um, do you want to introduce us a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. So this this is a um, uh, this work was designed to be a five channel uh, projection, and um, I worked with the London uh, Improvisers Orchestra and composer Cat Hope, who will talk about a little bit more um, for the sound for this. So this the work each channel um, explored the island histories of um, of various castle islands around the world, including the Isle of Wight, Wadjamup that I spoke about before, um, but was really based around um, an island called Ponte Canissi, which some of you may know was the island that Arnold Bockman painted in his Isle of the Dead series. And it's a work that I keep um, referencing time and time again. So this particular project, The Moment of Disappearance, um, uh, really foretold uh, in, in somewhat abstracted ways um, the experience of a man whose memories of these island sites drove him into madness. And so the, the work kind of uh, um, explores the way that history um, follows us around. was composed by Cat Hope um, and recorded with the London Improvisers Orchestra. And the, the, the kind of the impetus for the film was thinking about these castle islands and the way that those practices of incarceration um, were, were linked. Um, but actually the starting place and, and some of the footage that you'll see in, in the trailer is of Ponte Canissi, which some of you may know was the island that Arnold Botkin painted in his infamous uh, Isle of the Dead series of paintings. So the work is about the way that history um, has followed this, this character around and um, created a form of madness. So it's, it's about the residue of history and how they're sort of contained within these island sites. But I actually had a question um, in relation to this film. Actually, I did have a question. I was going to come back to the sound. Uh, but I had a question which was about the octopus, because this is the, the image, after watching this um, a few times, this is the image that keeps coming coming back to me. Yeah, um, no, it's, well, that's it's, it's really disturbing. Uh, and in fact, uh, um, you know, I recently watched that, uh, that, uh, that lovely documentary about the life of that octopus, and um, it's quite haunting. But I, I will say that I personally did not uh, partake in any um, killing of octopus uh, for this film, and uh, it was one that I purchased from the... Um, from the fish market. So, yeah, so I suppose the, the um, you know, I was thinking about the relationship between silence and violence and, and the way that, um, you know, the, 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 the octopus in the film becomes this kind of um, metaphor for um, this kind of, you know, violent um, haunting that, um, that this man encounters at the beginning of the film. 
um, he, he has this, a much more um, kind of gentle relationship um, in the water and then it's sort of, you know, this sort of tension builds throughout the film. So I think, um, you know, I mean, in hindsight, it, it's also, you know, my later work has been exploring things to do with climate change and the way that it links with these sorts of colonial histories. And I, and I think there's probably some clues in, in my use of it in that particular work. The other thing that um, I think really interested me about this film, and it's perhaps not so, not so, people might not be able to pick this out from the trailer, was, was it's a very transnational piece of work. I mean, and I guess that's why you sort of had everything sort of beamed up on, di on different screens. Um, the idea of filming in different um, locations. And I think um, this makes me think of a couple of things. First is the, the, the interconnectedness of islands that is often, is often ignored. Um, and also the way that um, different kind of factors that happen in, in certain types of um, certain island spaces then get, get supplanted as if, as if um, you know, all islands are the same. Um, and I also think something that people um, people forget, um, people in the UK forget, is the use of places um, like the Isle of Wight, the Isle of Man, as housing, you know, as being places that house prisons. And you know, there's an incredible number of um, prisoner of war camps um, in Second World War. Um, and another place that I, I'm uh, familiar with is um, in that, France. Uh, we have um, in Dore, which is on the Atlantic coast near La Rochelle. Um, and it was where convicts would set off to go to. So they'd be housed there for a while. And then when the boat arrived, they would be sent to um, French Guyana um, um, and I also think so about three weeks, three weeks uh, journey. Get, and what's uh, interesting is the prison is still there and it's still, um, you know, it's still a regular prison. It holds people who are doing very long sentences. So it's an aging population. Um, and it's right next to Saint-Martin-de-Ré where people go for very nice French, you know, a bit like going to Brittany, go for very nice kind of fishing port, um, beach holiday and people are quite surprised when they realize that the prison is still there and actually there are people still in that prison um and so what struck me is is this kind of interconnectedness that you that you explore in your in your work and, and in other works as well yeah so i mean it was such an interesting uh, point and you know it was really interesting to hear about your research into kind of the french use of island so in my recent monograph academic text i sort of explored the British Empire really through thinking about island geographies and how islands were instrumental to the success of the British Empire, you know, right up into the Falklands Islands, you know, you sort of, there's the sense that, um, that you know, the, the British identity is made at sea. And in fact, you know, when you think about slaving islands, prison islands, islands have been absolutely instrumental to, to the success of this little tiny mouldy island that we all live on, um, or that perhaps most of the audience lives on with this very small population of 60 million people. And I often reflect on how it is that this, this little island that we live on is so successful, and it is through the kind of mechanisms of, of colonialism um, and, and kind of, um, I guess, mechanising, instrumentalising the resources and of these fact, islands. You know, um, and island, what's interesting in the Australian context is that, you know, obviously Australia became this giant castle island and then, you know, um, the kind of the new Australians, the, the white colonists, the white settlers, then used islands all around the island of Australia as prison islands, um, particularly for Indigenous people. So, you know, there was leper islands, there was prison islands, there was all kinds of, they were used in all kinds of ways. Um, and so, you know, when I moved back to Britain 10 years ago, you know, this sense of you know, what does islandness mean, you know, and how it is kind of instrumental in the formation of national identity. You know, I was able to think about how, um, you know, whether, like you say, the Isle of Wight, where some of this work was filmed, um, was, in fact, um, there was a, um, a sort of like a ball store, like the, the naughty boys on the Isle of Wight. And, in fact, for about a decade, they were also sent all the way to um to the isle of wight in the early 20th century so it's um it's interesting to think about how um you know that the underbelly of these um uh, colonial mechanisms um you know was this sort of island geography but then on the other hand as you say when you think about you know uh these beautiful island destinations that you know feature in our imagination as holidays as escapes as um as you know these sort of um you know amazing uh landscapes 
there's also this tension between the beauty and the terror. And I think that's often what I explore in my work and often the way that I kind of use sound, in fact, to think about, you know, how you combine a, an image of an incredible space with a, with a, um, with sound that might point to some of these um, more difficult histories. It makes me think of what I think Michael Michael Pausick says in the uh, Michael Caine Museum about, you know, all prison islands have, have also been treasure islands and vice versa at, at various points. And he has this kind of list of, of prison islands that he, all the ones he can think of, which is actually quite a short list. Um, there's obviously much more. It's also interesting to um, think about the British Empire because, um, of course, um, prison islands for, I guess, colonial subjects rather than British subjects um, this continued so with the Andamans and with other examples. And the French, who had their penal colony much later, would point to this kind of ongoing use of, of um, prison islands for colonial subjects. They would point to this as a rationale for trying to keep hold of places like Condal, which is off the coast of Vietnam, even after they were kind of um, realising they're going to have to withdraw from this territory. They, there was this, this obsession with keeping an island as a prison island. Um, you know, and it wasn't, you know, always very clear to what end. It was, it was this sort of, some kind of fantasy around, around keeping people locked up. Um, so you mentioned very briefly, you, you also alluded to the Leper Island, and, and this might kind of um, work nicely with kind of introducing your, your next film. So I guess the other way that islands are perceived within this kind of colonial imaginary is this idea of the sealed off space. So it's often a space of quarantine. Um, so um, I know from French Guiana there was there was various islands which were used um, when um, you know for for people again again le as leper colonies, um, but also spaces for for certain types of experiment. So again, the idea of the tabula rasa, this kind of like it's a lab, the, the, the island is a laboratory. Yes, it's this idea that that these spaces have no ecology, that they have no humanity, that they're somehow um, Safe, but I've I've conflated some of those um, some of that footage with um, uh, islands off Scotland that were used in similar ways. So I think that there's also this idea of othering, you know, like these other people somewhere else are doing these terrible things. So I think part of that kind of you know colonial um, reconciling is about well let's look at the practices that you know that we have also um, engaged in until very recently in fact, and as you say with this um, new policy in Rwanda.
Okay, so we 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 understand the sound has has worked now. So we're hugely relieved about that. Although actually, um, the first thing I did want to ask about this film was I really I mean I really like the the kind of composition, the the overlaying of the the different images and and this sense of connecting different histories as opposed to making these very kind of fragmented. Um, and I guess my I guess the sort of question. Um, Kind of in relation to that was, was maybe um, to, to learn a bit more about the different archives that you that you drew on for the footage and how you, how you got hold of that. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, this, this on a very practical level, this was a, a work that I made with no budget. So sometimes when I have a budget, like in the, the previous work that we watched, Moment of Disappearance, I employ an editor um, to work with me to, to put all the footage together. And the the... The process of working with an editor means that you have to sort of almost have a real sense of then this happens and then this happens and you sort of have to storyboard the narrative for them to work with. But when you're um, self, uh, self-editing self and you're playing around and you're also um, teaching yourself how to use Final Cut Pro as I was when I was making this film, Sometimes it's a much more playful um, relationship and, and you can sort of, you know, grab something from your iPhone, you can grab something from here, you can grab something from there. And, you know, the footage from Scotland, for example, was um, footage that I found on YouTube, um, as well as footage from a nice camera, as well as footage from my phone. And so, you know, you're able to sort of like overlay and, and play with things. In fact, which is sort of, you know, how how my creative practice um, coalesces in my mind is that actually a much more accurate way of, of thinking about how I'm connecting things um, and connecting images and and and, um, and histories and sound and um, and experiences and it's also how memory performs, right? You know, it's not this sort of, you know, sequence of um, you know chronological events, but it's sort of almost this um, you know trifle of of meaning that's going on in the back of your mind. So. Um, yeah, I, I sort of see this work as sort of part of like my experimental film um, repertoire, um, largely because I've edited it myself. Which, which is also fitting, given that it was a kind of space of you know, space of experimentation. Can I ask? Um, I was really intrigued by what you were eating. Are you eating something at the? It's also interesting yeah. that you put yourself into the film because that's yeah. the other thing that happens with representing these island spaces is that the 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 colonizer, I guess, or the, the person um, telling the history kind of removes themselves. Yeah, so I was doing um, a little bit of research when I was in St. Petersburg on the silver poets um, uh, in Russian history. And, you know, there's a lot of um, kind of mythology around what happened during various episodes of um, 20th century Russian history, ironic that we're talking about them now. Um, around censorship and, and what happened to, to knowledge and information and creative work during, um, for example, during the, uh, the, style, the period of Stalin. And um, so this, um, I was I was looking at the at um, a number of poets who are recorded as having um, uh, eaten their own poems as a way to elude, as sort of evade censorship or they would burn them, or they would mem- get other uh, poet friends of them to memorise them, so that there was never any paper evidence, it was never written down. So it was also about that kind of removal of the archive and what we do to preserve the archive. So in this particular sequence, I'm actually, um, I've been writing poems to my mother and I've been eating them, you know, so it was sort of like this personal thing. So thinking about how the... Um, this idea of silencing also, um, you know, it's a sort of a personal experience as, a, as, a well, as well as this sort of like larger social mechanism of, of dealing with the archive. You know, silencing happens at these sort of micro and macro levels. Um, and that was just me in my studio, actually. Um, you know, was set up with a tripod, filming myself. <laughs> Again, just sort of playing around being faithful. Oh, yeah, no, no, that's really... Um... That's a really kind of interesting to learn the background because because the rest of the time there's a real sense of particularly with the overlaying of some of the images a real sense of kind of contamination I think that that feeling of um, those experiments that, that are kind of polluting and contaminating so then then to see you eat something in that context like, oh um, yeah absolutely but I, I and I was also thinking about that that thing about how you know <laughs> contamination can be 
you know, the contamination of ideas um, or, the, or, the, or the assumption of the contamination of ideas and what knowledge does and how archives are manipulated and framed and also um, removed, but also then on the other hand, used to kind of formulate um, ideas around national identity and, and how we visualise ourselves. And I mean, one of the things that's very interesting when I think, for example, about um, uh, the history of massacres and genocide in Australia is that there is almost, as far as I can tell, there are no photographs. There is nothing. You know, there's not one photograph of a massacre site. So when we think about, um, so for example, lynchings in, in the US, you know, we have images come into our mind, right? But what happens when we have no images, when there is no visual archive, you know, because images are so important in our memory. So, uh, you know, I'm often thinking about this process of erasure um, and how that plays out and how islands also assist in that. You know, when something's off there on an island, it's almost like we can we can really put it out of our consciousness. And perhaps that's why we like the idea of the island as a prison. Because yeah. we can we yeah. can put these people that somehow we see as being apart from us out of out of sight, out of mind. That that makes me think of a lot of Ariel Azale's work. So I mean she has the chapter, you know, um, you know, is there there's no photographs of rape kind of thing or uh, and also the you know looking through kind of police archives and saying well there's no there's there's certain things that are not there and and it's this this kind of almost um blanket absence of something which she's like there must be something there it's almost too there's too much silence i guess yeah um and I think, you know, this is, I mean, you know, when we talk a little bit later around my collaboration with Kat, for example, you know, in the absence of a marker, of a memorial, of a thing, of something visual that we can pin ourselves to, you know, what are the other methods of recognising, you know, what's happened in place, you know, so that's where that kind of practice around listening also arises from, is, you know, just trying to find something to replace an absent archive and also I guess um, you know the, the kind of hyper visualization of um, certain types of, of imagery around around um, the castle around um, you know the exoticism as well um, and finding a way to way to sort of unsettle that I guess um, so so I guess it's um, it's probably um, about time we started to talk a bit more about sound um, so I guess kind of putting the um, putting the, the, the technical hitches behind us um, uh, and thinking um, about I mean it, this is this is very um, this is very clear in, in um, the the film that we've just seen um, the importance of sound and that kind of sound that creates some dissonance the the um, the kind of eeriness um, and I'm a, was this another collaboration with Kat? I can't remember. Yeah, so Kat made the sound for that work. In fact, it was an existing piece of um, violins that followed each other, but slightly off key. So it was this, um, you know, which is, again, those two parallel islands and thinking about their histories, but also, as you say, this sort of disconcerting sound, which kind of creates a sonic frame for how we read the images. And I think, I think um, the next thing we're going to look at, um, look at, the, uh, I can't not talk it in kind of visual visual terms. Um, the next thing we're going to listen to um, is going to be um, an excerpt from um, Cat Hope's um, opera Speechless. And I think um, perhaps it'd be really nice to talk about um, some of the background to this, but also um, I guess some of the things that, that, that you've learned um, through working with Cat um, in particular. Yeah, so Cat and I have been collaborating, gosh, I'm showing my age now, almost 20 years, I think. Um, uh, maybe it's not quite as long as that. It's getting close. Um, and Kat is a composer and sound artist, and we actually met in Western Australia. We both grew up there, and we were um, we were on the board of directors at the Perth Institute of Contemporary Art, and she was sort of like the person there representing um, performers, and I was the visual artist sort of representing the needs and desires of visual artists in the sector. Um, and we've been really working together ever since. And one of the great things that... Um, that I guess I will be forever grateful to Kat is, um, is, is, the, is teaching me how to listen. And uh, it sort of sounds kind of arbitrary, but, but it really wasn't. The first work that we collaborated on was for the Sydney Biennale, yeah, 15 years ago or so. And um, we, 
we were, I was looking at a massacre site about two hours south of where, um, where we grew up. And it was this beautiful uh, national sort of trust forest um, where um, a thousand more Dandy Noongar people had been massacred over a period of five years. And this had essentially been removed from the archive. It wasn't referenced. All the individual deaths were just sort of seen as incidental and no one had really looked at it as this sort of uh, um, persecution against these uh, local Indigenous groups um, over a long period of time by the white settlers in the area. Um, and so... We spent three days in that forest recording the sounds of the forest. There was nothing there. There was no markers. There was no memorial. There was in the local heritage centre, there was nothing about this information. And it was stuff that I had sort of retrieved from the archives in the Bathy Library um, over some weeks of putting all these things together. Um, as well as Indigenous um, oral histories about these ma massacres um, that, you know, that obviously Aboriginal people knew exactly what had happened there. Um, and so we, we listened to the forest for three days, you know, really sat and in quietness listening to the sounds. And uh, it was a real practice in meditation, really. And so for the final work, um, which was a panoramic image of printed onto um, synthetic fabric in a timber drying shed on Cockatoo Island in Sydney Harbour, which was a sort of a colonial island and for a short time a penal island as well. But we put the we drew the low frequency sound out from the work uh, from the, the recording and put subwoofers underneath the, the drying shed floors, but very very low. So that when you were in the work, when you were standing inside this beautiful work, which you could look through, it was sort of semi-transparent, you could look through and see this amazing view of Sydney Harbour. So it's very beautiful. But you had this very low frequency sound underneath your feet. So there was this sense of, um, and lots of people didn't even notice the sound, but they came out of the work feeling very unnerved. So Kat's really interested in how low frequency sounds can psychologically affect us. So a lot of the work that she, she does is around uh, low frequency stuff. Um, and I can talk a little bit about a project that we're working on um, at the moment. So this particular work that we're going to listen to of Cats, which I didn't have anything to do with, um, but is just a really fabulous, important project that she's just worked on, which is an opera, her first opera, um, called Speechless. And it was, um, it was composed in response to experiences of children in detention in, uh, um, in Narumanu Islands in the north of Western Australia. So, of course, the, the prison island um, agenda continues in Australia. Um, and there was a, um, uh, the uh, ambassador for human rights, Gillian Triggs, in Australia. I don't think that's her exact correct title. Um, she did a report on this where she um, had children talk about their experiences of being in detention um, and, and they also did drawings. So Kat wrote this opera called Speechless, which talked about, which really kind of, uh, you know, was a, you know, when I say opera, she worked with um, vocalists from all sorts of traditions, from heavy metal through to classically trained um, soloists, um, an ensemble, a choir, um, to really think about what it sounds like to have no voice and what it feels like to be detained. Um, so, you know, this is this incredible work that um, debuted um, in Australia a couple of years ago.
So that was a little bit from, I think, the beginning of Act One of the opera. So um, I, I had the um, privilege of choosing and, of course, you know, obviously wanted to play play more. But um, I thought this was quite a nice visit because it does show the kind of rise and fall of fall of sound. Um, before I ask, before I ask um, Kate another question, I've been, um, it's been suggested I remind you or tell you for the first time, since I was cut off perhaps before, that you're welcome to post questions into the chat. Um, and you're also um, welcome if, you, if you're not subscribed to YouTube and you, so you can't put it into the chat you can email it to us at formations at ntu.ac.uk so formations with an S at ntu.ac.uk and um, we're running a little bit over time but we will we'll aim to leave a little bit of space at the end um, to hear what you, what you want to know and what you um, have to say um, so Kate um, thinking about um, speechless, I was wondering kind of um, if you could say a bit more about maybe how the audience is engaged with that, how they reacted. Obviously, it's quite different um, sort of playing it through the internet to being there. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think, well, sadly, I, I wasn't in Australia for it, so I have only also seen it through the internet. Um, but we're hoping that, um, that it will tour, so that's something that I know that Kat is working on at the moment. Um so, yeah, I think from, from what Kat said, I think, you know, obviously when you call something an opera, people have expectations about what that is going to be, right? Um, and, uh, and I think uh, also when you're dealing with something that has, um, you know, a really strong narrative like the issue around children in detention in Australia and then to put no words to that, you know. You know, so I think that that's... Um, you know, people were really, you know, found, I think people were overwhelmed by it. I think it enabled the freeing up the removal of speech and the removal of those operatic traditions and having, you know, people with kind of, uh, you know, heavy metal training um, voice those, um, the, the score that, um, that Kat wrote. Um, you know, it really enables the audiences to have an embodied experience, I guess, where you've got those sounds you know, resonating through your body, you can't, well, you have to, you I have think to it the free. that is the only way, that's the only access point when you don't have words. So I think, um, yeah, I think that the, the audience reaction to it was overwhelmingly powerful because they were being asked to um, use different reference points, I think, to engage with sound. And that's what's super interesting about Kat's work is that, um, you know, she's sort of always pushing at the boundaries of, of um, what we expect things or think things should sound like. Yeah, no, um, I guess there's also the thing with, I guess, calling something an opera, there's obviously going to be a certain class dimension as well. Um, and actually perhaps making making um, the type of people who'd go to an opera feel uncomfortable, I think is, is um, and, and, and actually have that kind of um, intro introspection as well as a result of this. That's, that that can only be a very good thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's 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 all, all the work. I mean, we're working on a project at the moment in London um, 
for St Mary Le Strand Church, which will debut next year. But it is it, the the work is about a group of women who have um, escaped climate disaster and have found themselves seeking refuge in the ruins of a church. And we're very keen to think about those traditions of the church, but then also to think again of like what what does loss and displacement sound like? What you know, and where do where is that sound in the body? So thinking about the body as an instrument and um, and the kinds of the kinds of sounds that um, that that might articulate in a felt and embodied way those experiences. Um, so we're working with dancers and um, uh, community choirs and um, uh, and you know musicians to sort of think about those um, yeah that sonic communication I guess. No, that's um, no, that's really interesting because I, I think in the church I mean in terms of acoustics churches are always kind of designed for for singing for kind of worship but also that idea of the church as being because, I mean, often we tend to think of, some of us, I guess, tend to think of the church as being very much a kind of um, arm of the government. So even in a secular society, being a kind of real estate owner and suddenly um, reimagining actually what what you would hope a church would be, a, a place of sanctuary. And, That's um, right. Yeah, so, I mean, it really calls, and it, the work will really call into a question, you know, what the role of these institutions are in society, you know, um, and I thought it was really interesting the other week where, you know, the Archbishop of Canterbury was sort of like, you know, debating Boris Johnson through the media about, you know, the Rwandan um, policy and about the kind of moral legacy um, of, of all of our institutions, whether they're governments, whether they're churches, whether they're education institutions, whether they're museums, you know, like what, you know, what is our role um, and, you know, who are we saving? Yeah, so, I mean, these are shared interests that Kat and I have together, I guess, and it's just, um, it's lovely to be able to collaborate with someone that's outside my own visual arts discipline um, and to come together through these sort of shared ideas. Okay, so I think um, just, I mean, I, I, I would ask you so much more about this new project as well, but um, which, am I right, is it it's called Never at Sea? Yes, exactly. Never yeah. at Sea. Okay, so I'll, what we'll do is we'll put up your 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 artist page at the end, so people can check it out a bit more yeah. and follow that. Um, but I'm aware I'm aware of um, the kind of passing of time, um, and um, I guess it would be really nice to to sort of before we before we open up the questions to to play our final bit of recording, which is very different to what we what we've shown and heard so far. And this is um, from a, a really awesome project. Um, so is it the Manus Recording Collective? Is that right? Yeah. Um, and um, as I understand it, these are recordings made by people who, who some of them were were on Manus, but um, but others were at different 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 sort of detention processing centres and places across Australia. Yeah. So there was uh, six artists and six detainees who were teamed up for this project, um, and so um, the listening devices were um, were sort of snuck into Manu, uh, Manu Island um, and so what you hear um, are little excerpts from their, their daily lives which were then kind of fed onto this website so people could um, listen in and this was very much in the context of a government that did not want even journalists to go to this island. There was It was like radio silence. So this was really a sort of um, a project that sought to um, disrupt that silence thing that was going on um, and uh, you know I mean th this is an issue that is still unresolved there's still people in detention on these islands. Yeah no and it, and it made me think very much of the, the French prison information group from the 70s so the idea of um, again active um, to prisons was, was heavily regulated journalism, journalism was very you know media was very controlled um, as it still is um, and it was this, we want to know what, just what it's like, you know, we're not asking you to, you know, um, you know, do more than say what is your experience. And, and I really felt, felt that listening to it. Um, well, it was, it's part of this dehumanisation, right? You know, absolutely, like if you, if yeah. you can't see anyone, you can't hear them. They're not really people. Um, so hearing them, you know, just, um, it, it can transport you. And also, I guess, again, as a kind of counter to that sort of also human right visual, um, I don't know what you call it, um, 
that fetishization of the of the image of the of the suffering refugee or suffering asylum seeker. Um, and actually, you, you and and what I really liked was that they they get I got the sense you know they really thought carefully about what they want to share. Um, and um, the the thing that I chose it's it's made uh, is it Mita Mita Melbourne. I can't remember the, what it stands for, but it's one of the places in Melbourne. And I think also um, listening to them, I was really it really brought home to me the fact that you might make it to Australia, but you're still going to be moved around constantly in terms of in terms of um, all these different places. So, and you might might just get used to one place and then you're moved on. So, yeah, or even move countries. So the Australian government is making deals with the US and New Zealand <laughs> and just. To, to, for the, the idea is that they will never come to Australia, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so I um, so the thing I chose is, um, I mean, there was there was, you know, so so many different types of, you know, it's su such a rich rich archive, if you like. Um, but the thing, the, the 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 clip I chose, and it's only a brief brief um, extract, um, is called Thanish giving his friend Sinner a haircut. Um, and I'll um, and I just really like this because um, when I if you listen to the whole thing, it's very much like he's, he's kind of crafted it as a kind of podcast in a way because he's got his, his recorded um, mobile phone sound, and it was just something for me about um, imagining him being there with his friend, giving him his haircut. His friends friends come along and start laughing, so you sort of think, oh my gosh, what has he done to his hair? And it, but he completely you know just carries on and says, no, I've given him a new style. And it's just something, there's something wonderful about this, this little recording. So um, I will stop talking and, and let you enjoy it now. Hello, hello everyone. Thanos from Mitra. Today I am going to care cut to my friend. I am waiting for him. Uh, and I'm meeting outside and listen some music. Good evening. Okay, I'm meeting with us. Uh, okay, he came to now. Pass it, Nana. Oh, Nana. Nana, come here. Nana, look here. Ah. Come here. Three men are going to fight, my dear. Okay. 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 He explained how to he wanna like to cut his hair. And I listen him. Okay. Uh Suti were short out in here. Short out. Short out. Okay. Huh. I'm short pant, eh? Mm, no. Okay. I'm going to pin it. Ah, last cup at the glass. Ah, ah. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Some of my friends are came to see how do I cut the care to him. Yeah, he will come after I finish the care cut.
So that was um, a little bit of um, Tanish giving his friends some uh, haircuts, um, and the recording goes on, and, um, and you get the sense of um, kind of him doing a really kind of taking really good care, despite the kind of being me, by his friends. Um, he is emailing, and then, and then he kind of finds that you know he wraps it up really nicely. Um, so uh, you know you really get a sense of as as um, Kate was saying this kind of rehumanization of people um, through through these little recordings. So. Um, I strongly recommend if you're if you're interested um, checking out the checking out the site. Um, so this I think it's Manus Recording Collective. Um, yeah, and it's um, I mean if you it was part of an exhibition called Eavesdropping, um, and it was curated by um, Liquid Architecture in particular, a chap called Joel Stern. So and you he, know, you really get a sense um, of you know he was I interviewed him for um, this book chapter that I've contributed to something that you're working on, Sophie, and and he was very interesting to speak to because he reminded me that not everyone wants to be heard as well, and that this idea of eavesdropping of like picking up sound you know, comes from, um, you know, a, a sort of, you know, there's sort of negative connotations of that because, you know, I always think about, you know, giving someone a voice as being, you know, liberating and, and celebratory. But in the context of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, corrupt governments or authoritarian governments, we don't always want to be heard. And so this was a really interesting counterpoint to this idea of, you um, um, listening or hearing as being an answer for truth. Um, yeah. So yeah, get 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 on and have a look. There's some really interesting texts around their writing as well, uh, around their projects as well. I think it's also that idea where people who are seeking asylum are, are obliged to tell their story so many times and not deviate from the story, but not be too polished in telling the story, um, and having to, you know, that that constant obligation to tell a story, um, to revisit trauma. But, yeah. but not to get too good at it, and actually that might not have to tell your story. Yeah. Um, maybe or just talk about something else. Talk about things, banal things that, that everybody else is allowed to talk about, and yeah. not be scrutinised for what you say. Yeah, and in fact, you know, the the um, Australian artists who were teamed up with the uh, uh, with the um, people in detention, you know, they really ended up being a sort of a barrier to those detainees because, in fact, they got so much press coverage from this project. And as you say, it was this kind of emotional labour that they were being asked to attend to time and time again. Um, and uh, you know, and I so I sort of also think that. Um, you know, not everyone wants the microphone, right? Um, and, uh, yeah, it's an interesting thing to think about around the ethics of listening. You know, who's doing speaking, who's listening, and where that in, where that data ends up. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I think we're going to open up to a little bit of discussion and questions now. So um, there's still opportunity if you if you haven't posted a question but you're, you're thinking about doing so or comment. Um, to add that to the chat or send it to formations at ntu.ac.uk. Um, we do have a question from um, Syncopate TV, um, which I'm going to read out. So um, Syncopate TV um, says, I'm thinking about Trinity Minna's, uh, Trinity Minna, whose work attempts to not speak to the contributors in her films, but to speak nearby um, them in her attempt to not speak for them or represent them. I'm also thinking about the silencing that you speak about and wonder if you've worked with the Indigenous people in Australia, given them voice or enabled their voices to be heard. Yeah, that's such a lovely reference to Trim and Hard Work. Um, I, I haven't Sorry, thought... I forgot to her name. No, that's totally fine. Um, it's, a, it's, an, it's an art person name. and um, uh, Yeah, so anyway, so it's really interesting to think about, uh, think about these, this, um, this kind of ethical dilemma and, in fact, it's something when I was doing my PhD 10 years ago or so that I thought about a lot is about, you know, at, at, you know where, you know, and, and this is something that is, is really different context actually in the UK because I would never, um, my work was very much around the practice of silencing stories, not the stories themselves because they're not my stories to tell. And so what I was, what I've always been very specifically interested in is the white 
forgetting that goes on and the white silencing and what um, um, some American academics talk about in the kind of North American context of this sort of epistemology of ignorance, which is this idea of agreeing to make things small. So it's not saying, oh, that history didn't happen. It's about going, oh, yes, yes, we know about that and moving right along. So it's just this sort of minimisation that goes on. So um, I guess my practice is much more interested in those systems of minimisation rather than, um, you know, uh, telling the stories that are not mine to tell, which are of genocide, which are of the terrible massacres, which are the experience of those oral histories. Having said that, whenever I work on a project that looks at those systems of silencing, I always work with um, Noongar people and acknowledge, you know, and work collaboratively with them in my research and sort of I would never go ahead with a project that um, didn't have the kind of the blessings and the authority um, of, of those um, of the Indigenous communities of, on whose land I'm doing the search on. So I think that that's just a sort of a, a methodological process. And, and it's also just about recognising my own power, whether it's as an academic or as an artist, and actually, you know, stepping away from the microphone myself and giving it to someone else entirely, you know. So, um, and so I think that that's just, and that's happening more and more. I mean, one of the wonderful things in Australia over the last 10 years has been that we have just so many more Indigenous artists and curators and museum directors who are just, um, doing really transformative things in um, in those sort of cultural spaces to privilege the voices and histories of um, First Nation peoples. And, um, you know, art's one of those last, Sebastian, it's like the last kind of ethical public forum, isn't it, where, you know, whether you're talking about climate change, technology, science, First Nation history, whatever it is that you're talking about, it's a space where... Um, we can have conversations that are kind of, um, you know, intelligent, civilised and expansive. Um, so anyway, I'm slightly rambling now. But, yeah, so just to say that absolutely I... Um, and But it's also different now. I work in the UK, so I work... Um, I'm very interested in thinking about how, you know, British systems of imperialism have silent voices specifically because that's the geography that I'm, that I'm now occupying, right? Um, so hopefully that answers your question, um, and thank you for asking it. So thinking about your um, thinking about your um, mention of, of working on working on indigenous lands, and it made me think about something that I thought might be interesting to, to finish up with, and that's the idea of, of different forms of collecting. So obviously artists are often collectors. Um, and I know I've seen your pic, your your pic on your website where you've got all those shells. Um, but um, I remember we had this fascinating conversation the other day. Um, I was I was talking about Patty Smith, who in M Train talks about going with her her husband to um, Saint Laurent du Maroni, where um, Jean Genet always dreamed of going. So this is this was the the, the transportation camp in French Guyana, and she goes and she. Um, she thinks, and it, and it also made me think about um, the idea of listening with your feet, because she goes and she imagines um, the people walking on the, on the, and, and um, compressing the, the land and, and goes and sort of digs up some stones and she gets these three stones and her plan is to, to take these and give them to Jean Genet um, by William Burroughs, who was a kind of mutual friend. Um, she doesn't get to do it, um, but, but much later she goes and visits Jean Genet's grave I think it's in Morocco, goes and, and, and um, there's a little film about this. And we're talking about this, this idea of, uh, which is a very kind of Western idea of going and taking something as a souvenir. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of your practices with listening, it's about collecting different, different type, a different type of collecting. Yeah, absolutely. And I, well, it is sort of like, it's collecting uh, sensations and memories as much as anything. And I think um, it was it was really great to be reminded of that story because of course in, in indigenous practices you would never move the stone you would never take it away because that's where it belongs and this concept that I've been working with this sort of listening with your feet is like that really sense of like standing on ground and listening to it you know that is an indigenous principle about being part of this ecology of um, balance and you know it would be terribly bad luck to take a stone and take it somewhere else because it belongs there right um and in fact there is um a lot of 
people that visit um, Uluru, um, some of you may remember it being called Ayers Rock um, in Central Australia. Um, and people historically used to, perhaps they still do it, um, take a rock with them when they visit it and take it away with them. And they're warned by Indigenous people in that area to not do that because it will bring them bad luck. Anyway, so apparently at um, Alice Springs Airport, there's this massive shed full of what's called sorry stones, where people have taken the stones away. They've gone back to wherever they came from and they found themselves having terrible luck. Um, and they think perhaps it's because of these, these stones that they've displaced and so they've sent them back um, to Alice Springs to where they belong. Um, so I think, um, I think the idea of collecting, you know, I like the idea of kind of collecting sounds, collecting memories, um, and, uh, you know, and thinking about something, so my shell, you know, um, being mindful that some things aren't, should stay where they are. Sorry, I didn't mean to shame you about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but those skills have followed me around everywhere for about 30 years, actually. But, um, but also, I think because also, because um, one of the things, I mean, I love Patterson, but one of the things where she talks about this, um, she imagines them wearing these stick boots, like workman's boots, and actually, a lot of the convicts ended up without shoes, and so they would have been. And I think there's this kind of idea of treading carefully. They would have, they would, they would have. Their feet would have been very kind of attentive to the ground and, and different things around um, the mud often. Um, and I think there's that idea of listening with your feet, of, of treading very carefully in order yeah, to do so. Absolutely, and also being. I mean, indigenous people wouldn't, you know, historically didn't wear shoes, and you know, this idea that you can walk on a very hot desert land and and you know, your, your your feet are not necessarily, um, you know, over time, you sort of like, it's like, the, I've just been reading this lovely story about the Korean um, uh, pearl divers who can withstand these kind of incredibly low temperatures. And it was the same for Indigenous people, you know, they're so in tune with the land, but also their bodies adapt to this idea of walk, walking their foot on the ground. And, um, you know, and that sense of... Um, you know, and you know, growing up in Australia, kids never wear shoes, right? They're in touch with the with the place that they live in a different kind of way. Mm. So, I think on that note, we should probably um, let our kind listeners um, go and get themselves some dinner, or if they're if they're tuning in from somewhere else, some some breakfast or some lunch. Um, so, I would like to give a huge, huge thanks um, to Kate. Um, also to Kat for allowing us um, to listen to her stuff um, I think we're going to put up if we haven't already um, Kat's website and also um, Kate's website um, so I invite you to, to check out some more of their stuff um, and keep an eye on um, Kate's new project Never at Sea which um, should be having stuff coming out over the next year, year or so yeah next March Sophie, thanks so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with you and to talk with you tonight. Well, I look forward to talking to you more soon. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Um, so you were obviously listening to Kate McMillan and myself as part of um, Formation's event. Um, so um, I think you maybe didn't hear my introduction previously. So this is organised by the, the amazing Jenny Ramone. Um, for Nottingham Trent in collaboration with Nottingham's Bonington Gallery. Um, you can check out um, our previous previous events and future events on our YouTube channel. And as my son um, would say, my nine-year-old son would say, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. So good night, everyone. Take care.